Uh, we're going to go over a few things in the respiratory system today. I'm going to split it up into two lectures. We have today and then we have on Thursday. I do want to give you guys some time, too, for the lab exam. All right, so I want to make sure that you are looking at any models that you want to look at for the lab exam that's on chapters 20 through 22, okay? So to begin with, uh, we're just going to go over some review. I know these kind of look tiny on your sheet. Hope that Hopefully you can see them well enough. But uh, we had talked about in general A&P, uh, we could... We could classify and divide up the nervous system, or divide up the respiratory system either um, by a conducting system um, and a respiratory system or by an upper and lower respiratory tract. So we're going to go over the classification that way first. So let's look at upper respiratory tract. That includes the nasal cavity and the pharynx. So if a person gets an upper respiratory infection, that's where they're getting an infection, in their nasal cavity, um, in their throat, they'll have a sore throat, okay? And then we have the lower respiratory tract, and that's everything below that. So the larynx is where the voice box is, the trachea, the primary bronchus, uh, the secondary bronchi, the tertiary bronchi, the bronchioles, the terminal bronchioles, the respiratory bronchioles and the alveoli. So those are all part of the lower respiratory tract. So any type of infection in there, you would say they have a lower respiratory tract infection. Then we can also um, divide them up by the conducting portion and the respiratory portion. So the conducting portion just means that's the portion that brings the air down. All it's doing is bringing air in and out. And so that's from the nasal cavity all the way down to the terminal bronchioles. And then we have the respiratory portion, and that's where there can be some exchange between the, um, the respiratory membrane, uh, the, the alveoli, and the blood. Okay, So the respiratory bronchioles and the alveoli are part of that uh, respiratory portion. Right? the only place like capillaries in the blood that's the only place where you can get exchange in the blood well here in the respiratory system these respiratory uh, bronchioles and the alveoli that's the only way that you can get air moving between the respiratory system and the blood okay so let's take a look at what this um, we'll look a little later at the lungs but I want to show you the respiratory tract Okay, so uh, we have the trachea. Now, I'm not going to talk much about the nasal cavity, the pharynx, the larynx. I mean, we went over those in general A and P. You do have some things on the lab exam. Uh, you'll have to look at the human larynx to find uh, all of the structures of the human larynx. Um, the pharynx is just another name for the throat. Okay. And then the nasal cavity have the concha in there, and that helps to slow down the air and moisten it as it comes in through the nasal cavity. But I just want to go over the respiratory tree here. So the trachea, we have, um, it's going it, to, it'll, it leads um, down from the larynx. Uh, it is only about four inches long, and then it bifurcates or it divides. It has a diameter of about one inch, okay? And then it divides, uh, it divides into these two primary bronchi. So we have the left primary bronchus and the right primary bronchus. So you would have to identify those as either right or left. That's just proper to do that. That's in their name. The left primary bronchus is going to go into the left lung. It penetrates into the left lung. The right primary bronchus penetrates into the right lung. And then um, shortly after that, the primary bronchus, which is here, is going to divide again. And then it's going to divide into the secondary bronchi. So we have two secondary bronchi in the left lung, and we're going to have three secondary bronchi in the right lung. Does anyone know why? It's the lobes, right. So each of those bronchi are going to go into a lobe. And so the left lung has two lobes, and the right lung has three lobes. So on the left side, we have two secondary bronchi. 
Then those secondary bronchi, once they're into those lobes, they're then going to branch off and they're going to um, create these tertiary bronchi. Okay. And then the tertiary bronchi are going to um, branch off to form bronchioles. Oops. Okay, the bronchioles. Now, the bronchioles, um, they are the ones, they lack cartilage. So all this way down, if you remember in the trachea, we had these uh, tracheal cartilages, and they're these C-shaped cartilages. They're open on the back side. Right, and that allows the esophagus to expand when you're swallowing food. And then as we get down into each one of these um, smaller airways, we start to see the cartilage start to break up a little bit. And by the time we get down to those bronchioles, there's no cartilage left, right? The bronchioles are, um, they, they also are dominated by a um, smooth muscle. Okay, so the smooth muscle surrounding those bronchioles are wrapped around those bronchioles in a concentric manner like that. And so when they um, contract, they're really going to close down the diameter of that bronchiole. And so we would call that bronchial constriction. When they relax, then they're going to open up the diameter of that bronchiole, and then we call it bronchial um, dilation. So the autonomic nervous system can really control the diameter there. We know that the sympathetic nervous system is fight or flight, so that's going to relax those muscles, and it's going to cause that diameter to increase. It's going to cause bronchial dilation. Okay? And then when the um, parasympathetic nervous system is stimulated, that's your rest and digest, so the bronchial is going to decrease in diameter, um, and the parasympathetic nervous system is stimulating that. Okay? Okay, then the bronchioles are going to continue to divide and get smaller and smaller. And the, um, <clears throat> the, the next um, division we have are called terminal bronchioles. That terminal bronchiole is just saying, okay, this is the end of the conducting pathway. That's it. We're done. We're ending the conducting pathway right there. And then the terminal bronchioles will, uh, they're going to branch off again, and they're going to become these respiratory bronchioles. Right. So uh, the respiratory bronchioles have little alveoli attached to them, and they're going to lead into an alveolar duct, which will lead into an even bigger uh, cluster of alveoli. And then that duct is going to lead into the, um, the atrium, and another name we have for that is the alveolar sinus. So that's just an, uh, an expanded uh, pocket that will lead into all of the alveoli that are clustering there. So I know on your um, one of the models, you have to be able to identify the alveolar duct as well as the alveoli. Okay. Okay, now the other thing is that the, we have the blood vessels that are going to um, surround all these alveoli. And so the pulmonary artery is coming from that right ventricle, and it's bringing blood into, uh, it, it's gonna keep branching and branching into little capillaries, but the pulmonary artery brings, and I shouldn't do that, I should do it in blue, because it is blue. It's bringing deoxygenated blood from the, the right side of the heart, right? So it's bringing the blood from the right side of the heart, and then at the alveoli, it's going to pick up oxygen. And then from there, it's going to return through the, to the heart uh, with oxygenated blood and going back through uh, to the heart through the pulmonary veins, right? So um, where that, uh, where the, the capillary meets that alveoli, we call that the respiratory membrane. That's the respiratory membrane. Bless you. Okay, so let's take a look at this picture here. So this is just showing one alveolus. 
and it's showing the, um, this is coming from the pulmonary artery, so this blood is going to be blue, and you can see that the capillaries branch off into this capillary network, and they surround that alveolus, and then that uh, blood is going to pick up the oxygen from the alveolus, and then it's going to return to the left side of the heart through the pulmonary vein. It's gonna to go to the left atrium. Okay, so here is yet another picture. Get rid of that spot there. Whoops, can't do that. Okay. So one of the things we know about is pneumonia. And pneumonia, um, when we're looking at the respiratory membrane, the respiratory membrane is going to include um, the, the lining of the alveolus and a basement membrane and the lining of the blood vessel. So that those three things make up the respiratory membrane. So any gases that come down into the alveolus has to cross all three of those things. The cells that are lining the uh, alveolus, those are simple squamous. And then you have your basement membrane, and then you have the cells that line the blood vessel, and those are simple squamous too. So they're really thin. That's a really thin res um, basement membrane, and gases should be able to cross that pretty easily. Now with pneumonia, what happens is pneumonia develops, um, it can develop from a, an infection, uh, and um, fluid starts to leak into the alveolus. And so fluid is leaking in there and it's, um, it's actually going to create a thicker respiratory membrane then. We now have an area that's you know, thicker because of that fluid, thicker than it should be. Okay. Pneumonia typically becomes uh, a more complicated problem if a person has already um, damaged respiratory membranes like they would have if they were smokers. Um, uh, people that are elderly, they're going to have some more difficulty. Uh, and then also um, patients that have had, um, have AIDS, uh, they also are going to have um, a damaged respiratory membrane. <clears throat> okay. All right, let's see what else we have here. The lungs, all right? So here we have the two lungs. On this side, we have the left lung, and on this side, we have the right lung. The lungs have, uh, the left lung has two lobes. It has a superior lobe and an inferior lobe, and they're divided by an oblique fissure. Each of the lungs comes to more of a point at the top, and we call that the apex. And at the bottom, it's more flat, and we call that the base. And then if we look at the right lung, we see it also has a superior lobe and an inferior lobe, but then it also has a middle lobe as well. Right? So the left lung can't have a middle lobe because there's a notch right there that is where the heart sits. So that makes room for your heart right there. Right? On the right lung, there is still the horizontal fissure that's separating that superior lobe from the other lobes. Uh, and then we have an oblique fissure that separates the superior lobe from the inferior and middle lobe. Okay. Superior lobe separates um, the superior lobe from the middle lobe, and the oblique fissure separates the superior lobe from the um, other two lobes, the inferior separates the superior lobe from the inferior lobe and the middle lobe from the inferior lobe. On the, on the medial aspect of the lung, we see the hilum, the hilum. And so the hilum is where all those major passageways enter into the lung. So we have the pulmonary artery that's bringing deoxygenated blood to the lung. And we have the two pulmonary veins 
that's taking oxygenated blood away from the lungs, and then we have the primary bronchus. And all of those are going to be entering into the lung in a place that we call the hilum. Okay, uh, let's see, one more thing I wanna go back and look at this alveolus. So normally on the alveolus, there are these cells um, that are gonna produce a substance called surfactant. Surfactant. Okay, and so surfactant is an oily substance and surfactant is going to line the inside of the alveolus, and it helps to reduce surface tension because there's a lot of tension against the side of that alveolus. And so it's basically helping to keep that alveolus from collapsing. There is, um, there is a disorder which is called the respiratory distress disorder. Okay, and that is where there is insufficient surfactant. There's not enough surfactant. And so um, the alveolar the alveoli tend to collapse and a person's not going to be able to uh, expand the alveoli and get enough air in them, and they'll have labored breathing. Okay, are those pictures way too small this time? On there, they're okay. Okay, so let's get into some physiology then. <clears throat> We're going to talk about external and internal respiration. So external respiration uh, is it's going to include three things. External respiration includes uh, what we call pulmonary ventilation. So pulmonary ventilation. And that's just bringing air in and out of the lungs. So we have to talk about the pressures and how that, why that happens. Then the second one is how once we have the air in the alveoli, how does oxygen diffuse into the blood vessels and how does carbon dioxide diffuse into the alveoli? So that's diffusion. Then the third process is gas transport once oxygen is in the blood, how does it get transported to the tissues? And then how does carbon dioxide get transported in the blood back to the lungs? So that's external respiration, right? Then when we get to the tissues, we have internal respiration. So internal respiration is how do we get the oxygen to diffuse into the tissues? And how do we get carbon dioxide to diffuse into the blood from the tissues? That's what internal respiration is. Right? And then in chapter 25, when we get to metabolism, we're going to talk about cellular respiration. And that's what does the cell do with that oxygen? How does that cell use oxygen along with glucose to produce ATP? Right? So we're going to spend time today talking about pulmonary ventilation, um, diffusion, and then gas transport will save for Thursday, and the rest of it will save for Thursday. All right. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is pulmonary ventilation. And we have to discuss how does air get from the environment down into your lungs? You know, how does that happen? 
we had discussed this in, in general, so hopefully this is a mostly review. It should be pretty much all review for you. The first thing that we have to talk about is uh, Boyle's Law. Boyle's Law. And Boyle's Law is just um, talking about the relationship between gas pressure and gas volume, right? So gas molecules exert a pressure when they're in a container. So even in the environment, we have this huge container with all this air, and it exerts a pressure in the environment of 760 millimeters of mercury. These gas molecules are bouncing all over the place. They're bouncing against each other. They're bouncing against objects, and they're in this container. And they exert a pressure of 760 millimeters of mercury. There's a whole bunch of gases. There's mostly it's nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and then water vapors. And all of these molecules are just bouncing against each other. So here we see a container that uh, is this particular size, and it has a pressure of 760 millimeters of mercury, right? And you can see the molecules inside there. Now, Boyle's law says that um, if you increase that container size, if you increase it, then what's going to happen to the pressure inside that container? The pressure is going to go down because now those molecules have more room. So they're not going to be bouncing against each other as much. So what this law says is that the pressure inside the container is inversely related to the uh, volume. That's what that is saying. So if you can expand the area, you're decreasing the pressure. And conversely, then, if you make that um, container smaller, <laughs> like half the size, and you decrease the volume, then you're going to increase the pressure because now those molecules are in a little box and they don't have as much room to move around, so they're bouncing against each other. All right. So uh, this is going to um, be the basis of <coughs> inhalation and exhalation. When you're not breathing, the pressure inside your lungs is 760 millimeters of mercury. In between breaths, when you're not breathing in and you're not breathing out, the pressure is equal to the environment, okay? Then in order to breathe in, uh, inhalation or inspiration, right? Inhalation, you expand, you're gonna expand the, the size, the volume inside your thoracic cavity and air is going to move from high pressure to low pressure. Right? Air always moves from high to low pressure. So to get the air in, you have to expand the volume and decrease the pressure. And that will bring air in. Okay. Then um, if to expire or to, for expiration or exhalation, you have to decrease the size of the thoracic cavity. So you decrease the size of that, that um, cavity, that container, that increases pressure. Now you're going to blow that air out because air always moves from higher pressure to lower pressure. Right? So when we look at the lungs here, here's the diaphragm right here, and here's the external intercostal muscles. So when you're not breathing, they're not doing anything. They're not contracting, they're not relaxing, they're just, they're not doing anything. But as soon as um, they contract, they flatten out. So the diaphragm flattens out and it expands the thoracic cavity by this much. At the same time, the external intercostal muscles are going to pull the rib cage up and expand the thoracic cavity that way. So we're expanding the thoracic cavity. So what's happening to the, the volume? Volume's getting bigger. What's happening to the pressure? Pressure is going lower. So which way is air going to move? It's going to move in, right? So when you're resting and breathing, 
that's what happens. The diaphragm contracts and the external intercostals contract and air moves in. And then during quiet exhalation, then you just relax those muscles. So you relax the diaphragm, goes back to its normal position, and you relax the uh, external intercostals. Okay, so the rib cage goes back down, and now we are decreasing the space. We're decreasing the volume, increasing the pressure, and air is gonna move out. So we can say that with quiet breathing like this, the inhalation process is an active process because you are contracting those muscles. Whenever you're contracting a muscle, and it's an active process. And then quiet exhalation is going to be a passive process because instead of contracting muscles, all you're going to do is relax those muscles. Now, sometimes um, you're not breathing quietly. Sometimes, you know, if you're having, uh, if you're exercising, if there's some pulmonary disorders, if um, you're stressed, then you're going to have to uh, have more forceful breathing. And so the forceful breathing is going to uh, recruit accessory muscles. So to increase inspiration or inhalation, if you're gonna increase inhalation, the accessory muscles you have to contract are the SCM, the scalenes, the pectoralis minor, and the serratus anterior. So the SCM muscles, they're in your neck, right? So if you are increasing inhalation, and, and so you, you've seen people that are trying to gasp, they're, they're breathing in really hard. <gasps> That's all neck. You can, you can see it in their neck. Their neck muscles are contracting. They're trying to really lift that rib cage so that you can make that space bigger, right? And then to increase exhalation, so when a person is using uh, exhalation, forcing exhalation, because maybe they have like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease where they can't get the air out, then they're gonna use muscles like the internal intercostals, the transversus thoracis, and the abdominal muscles. So these abdominal muscles I think are key here. Because when you see a person that is forcefully trying to breathe out, you can, see, you can see that they're using their abdominal muscles. They're going, <sighs> and by, by contracting those abdominal muscles, they're pushing up on that diaphragm, trying to squeeze that space even smaller. Right. Okay, so some terms that we have to know here. Eupnea, this is quiet breathing. In quiet breathing, the exhalation is passive, the inhalation is active. And there's two different types of eupnea. Um, there's all, there's um, two subcategories. There's diaphragmatic breathing. So diaphragmatic breathing is deep breathing. That's where you're using your diaphragm. Breathe in and breathe out. You're, you're increasing the depth and you're just contracting that diaphragm and then relaxing that diaphragm. It's still quiet breathing because it's the diaphragm you're talking about. Uh, you're not talking about those accessory um, muscles. And then costal breathing is another type of eupnea, and that's more shallow breathing, and this is where you're using the internal intercostals. So you're, <laughs> and you're just using those short little shallow breaths um, to, to um, contract and rela to contract those um, intercostal muscles and bring the rib cage up, which is going to increase inhalation. Right. So we see this like in pregnant women when they 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 have a lot of pressure up against their diaphragm. They have to expand that area somehow, and they don't have a lot of room down in the abdominal area with a growing baby. So they'll do the internal, external intercostals and shallow breathe shallow to try to increase the space. Okay. All right, some other terms um, that I don't have on here, but some other terms that you should know are hypoxia, 
Hypoxia is a term that says you have a decrease in oxygen level in the tissues. Bless you. Whereas hypoxemia means you have low oxygen in the blood. So for future reference, anytime you see emia, it's talking about blood. Hypokalemia, that's low cal uh, potassium in the blood. Hypercalcemia, that's high calcium in the blood. All right, so emia just means in the blood. Anoxia means you have a complete loss of, of oxygen supply. Okay. Okay, so I want to also talk about compliance. So compliance is how easy is it for your lungs to expand? Uh, basically, how long, how how easy it is is it for the alveoli to expand? So the alveoli, not only do they have those capillaries surrounding it, so you can get oxygen into the blood and carbon dioxide out of the blood, you also have these elastic bands that surround the, the, that surround the alveoli. And these elastic bands are, they're like rubber bands. And so whenever, the, um, whenever that alveoli fills up with air, then there's gonna be a recoil and it's gonna push that air back out as soon as the pressure in, in the thoracic cavity increases. So those elastic bands help to squeeze that air back out, right? So um, compliance, the definition of that is that there is, how, how easy is it to expand that alveolus? So if you have low compliance, that means that it's more difficult to expand it and if you have increased compliance, that means that um, it's really easy to expand it. It's going to be harder for it to recoil, all right? So, for example, um, this is normal compliance here, right over here, normal compliance, where the alveolus uh, will expand. So it's expanding, getting bigger, and then those bands, those elastic bands, are going to recoil and bring it back to its normal shape. So that's just normal, right? When you have a condition like COPD, um, that alveolus can't expand all the way. There's some type of obstruction there, and so that alveolus isn't expanding all the way, so we say that the lung has decreased compliance with COPD. It's an obstructive disorder. You don't have um, you have lower compliance, right? They can't expand. Something's obstructing the airflow and they, you're not getting the expansion. On the flip side though, when you have a disorder called emphysema, emphysema damages and destroys those elastic bands. So now what we see is that the elastic bands are gone and the alveolus can expand, but now there's nothing to recoil it. So it has really high compliance. It has high compliance. Very easy to expand. The problem, that's not the problem. The problem is there's no way to recoil it because those membranes have been damaged. Okay. Um, and of course, this can also be affected by surfactant. If you don't have surfactant, then the alveoli will collapse, okay? Uh, in which case, um, you know, you're going to have, uh, it's going to be decreased, uh, in, it, increased compliance in, in, with uh, surfactant, uh, lack of surfactant as well. Okay. So now, let's look at the pleura. 
So if you remember what pleura is, pleura is a serous membrane that surrounds the lungs. We have the um, parietal pleura, and the parietal pleura is lining the thoracic cavity, so that's on the outside. And then on the inside, we have the visceral pleura, and the visceral pleura is surround, it's, it's um, covering the lung tissue, right? And in between those two, then, we have the um, space, which we call the intrapleural space. Right, so a couple of terms. That space in between the two layers of the pleura is called the intrapleural space. Then on the inside of the lung, we have the intrapulmonary space, right? So inside here, this is the intrapulmonary space. intrapulmonary space. So when we look at um, breathing in and out, let's just talk about the different pressures. So we know that the environment at sea level is 760 millimeters of mercury. And we know in order to breathe in, the pressure inside the lung has to be lower because air is going to move from higher to lower pressure to inhale. So the pressure inside the lung can be uh, a negative one or 759 millimeters of mercury, that's enough to bring air in. Just has to decrease by that much to bring air in. And then to exhale, so that would be a negative one in order to inhale. Okay. In order to exhale, your pressure has to be higher than the environment. So your pressure would have to be a plus one in the intrapulmonary space, or 761. And then you would exhale. The pressure has to be greater in order to breathe out. Okay. And if the pressure inside the intrapulmonary space is 760 millimeters of mercury, well, that's equal to what we have uh, in the environment, and so air is not going to move in or out. There's no breathing. Okay. Then we have that intrapleural space. So the intrapleural space is going to be less than the intrapulmonary space. It's going to average a negative four millimeters of mercury. It averages negative four. It's going to help to keep the lung expanded and not to collapse. It can go as um, low as a negative 18 millimeters of mercury if you have um, bleeding but on average it's negative four. So negative four means when you're inhaling and your pressure in the intrapulmonary space is 759, that would mean in the intrapleural space it would be 754, because it's negative four. When you're exhaling and the pressure inside the intrapulmonary space is 761, that means that in the intrapleural space the pressure is going to be 757, right? You're going to subtract it. 761 minus 4, okay? Okay. Um, All right, so any questions on any of this so far? All right, let's talk about respiratory rates and volumes. 
Okay, so a respiratory cycle is the amount of air that you're bringing in and out in a normal um, breathing pattern. So one time breathing in and breathing out, that is a respiratory cycle. Breathe in and out one time. So from that, then, um, we, can, we can look at what a normal respiratory rate is. So a respiratory rate is how many times do you breathe in one minute? Right? How many of those um, cycles do you go through in one minute? So in an adult, the normal is 12 to 18 respiratory cycles per minute. And in children, it's 18 to 20 respiratory cycles per minute, right? So that's the rate of breathing. Now, if we wanna look at the volume of breathing, uh, we are going to look at the respiratory minute volume. Um, let's go back. We're gonna look at the tidal volume and that will give us a, a respiratory minute volume. So let's talk about tidal volume. So we had the respiratory rate, that's how fast you're breathing per minute. The tidal volume is the volume of air during inhalation and exhalation at rest. What's the volume that you bring in? It's usually around 500 mils for both men and women, right? So that's the, the tidal volume. If we wanna calculate then what we call the respiratory minute volume, the respiratory minute volume, this is the respiratory rate times the tidal volume. That's gonna tell you how much air you're bringing in and out in one minute, right? So this is a calculation that you have to be able to do. The respiratory minute volume, if your respiratory rate is 12 breaths per minute and your tidal volume, how much air you bring in in one breath, is 500 mils, then you multiply those two together and you come up with 6,000 mils per minute. And to convert that into liters, we can just say six liters per minute, right? Now that's how much air you're bringing in and out. But when we look at your, your um, respiratory tree, right? Uh, that air has to get all the way down into the alveolus. So you're bringing this 500 mils of tidal volume into your lungs and 350 of mils of that will reach the alveolus. The other 150 mils of that air gets caught up in that anatomic dead space, which is all the conducting pathway. So 150 mils of it never even reaches your alveoli. So now we wanna look at calculating the alveolar ventilation. How do we calculate that? Well, we have to take that anatomic dead space into consideration. So it's the same equation, but we're taking the 12 breaths per minute and we have to look at the, the uh, tidal volume, how much air you're bringing in, and then we have to subtract how much got stuck in that anatomic dead space. So 12 times 350 is equal to 4,200 mils per minute or 4.2 liters per minute. So even though you're bringing in to your conducting pathways, you're bringing in six liters per minute, getting to the alveolus, you only have 4.2 liters per minute and that's what really matters. How much can get down into that alveolus because that's where the exchange is gonna occur with the blood. All right. So we're going to do a spirometry lab on when we come back from break. We're not gonna do it on Thursday. I have it scheduled for when we come back. I'm just gonna leave it for when we come back because you have your lab exam on Thursday. 
uh, and then we're going to finish up this chapter on Thursday. So this will be the Tuesday that you come back from spring break. Okay. So let's go over the pulmonary volumes and capacities. Um, so the first thing is we have the tidal volume, and we will write that as V with a subcase T. So that's the tidal volume. That's the amount of air that you're bringing in and out of the lungs when you're breathing quietly. Then we have what's called the expiratory reserve volume. And the expiratory reserve volume is from the, the end of that uh, vi tidal volume all the way down to the amount of air that can be exhaled um, forcefully. So this is the expiratory reserve volume. It's the amount of air that you can exhale at the end of the tidal volume at the end of a resting tidal volume. How much air can you push out? So when we do the spirometry lab, you're going to do that. You're going to be blowing into the um, machine. Uh, it's, it will have it hooked up to a computer so that we can see your chart. And you're going to breathe in normally, breathe out normally, and then you're going to have to push that air out as hard as you can. And that's going to give you your expiratory reserve volume. The inspiratory reserve volume then, that's at the end of breathing in, then you breathe in as hard as you can. Maximal inhalation at the end of that tidal volume. You breathe in, and then you breathe in as hard as you can. So it's the amount of air at the top of that tidal volume. How much air can you maximally breathe out? Ah, sorry, breathe in. It's the amount of air that can be inhaled over and above the tidal volume. Inspiratory reserve volume. All right, so then we have this other volume that's called the residual volume. And the residual volume is the air that's left in your lung at the end of your forced exhalation. So even after you've breathed out everything you have in your lung and you feel like there's nothing left in your lungs, there's still air left in there and that's called the residual volume. It's the residual volume, right? And even if you punctured a lung, even if you punctured that lung and you lost a bunch of air, you would still have a little bit of air left in there and we call that the minimal volume, the minimal volume. There are a couple of capacities then that we have to know. Capacities are equations. They're where we're going to add these things together to look at um, different capacities. So the first capacity we have is called the functional residual capacity. And the functional residual capacity is the expiratory reserve volume plus the residual volume. It's like after you've breathed out normally, how much air is in your lungs? It's adding the expiratory reserve volume plus the residual volume. That's what the functional residual capacity is. So capacity is always a, an equation. The vital capacity, so vital capacity, I always think of as, um, you know, your, your life, the life, vital means like life. The vital capacity is the, um, it's going to be the um, adding the inspiratory reserve volume plus the tidal volume plus the expiratory reserve volume. That is the vital capacity. Yep, the vital capacity is the inspiratory reserve volume plus the tidal volume plus the expiratory reserve volume. So basically, it's how much air can you possibly breathe in and out forcefully? You add those all up, and that's your vital capacity. 
vital because that's what you have to deal with. That's what you, you have. And then total lung capacity is all of it together. You have the inspiratory reserve, tidal volume, expiratory reserve, and then you have the residual volume. So all of it. So I want to ask you this. In a person that has COPD, they have a hard time breathing out. It's like breathing through a straw, right? So their expiratory reserve volume is going to be decreased. What then happens to their residual volume? That's increased. The residual volume then has to increase because there's more air that's left inside the lungs, right? So they're not getting all of the carbon dioxide out that they should be getting out because it's staying inside the lungs, right? So that can lead to, that can be a problem. That can back up into the blood. And now you've got too much carbon dioxide in the blood, right? I'm confused. I thought that was emphysema that you can't get everything out. Emphysema is where, um, so uh, it, obs there's many obstructive disorders. So chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, emphysema is part of it. And chronic bronchitis is the other part of it. So together, they make a condition that we call chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD. Mm -hmm. OK. All right. Let's take a quick break. All right. So lastly, um, today, what we're going to talk about is gas exchange. Uh, we're going to talk about the external respiration, where gas is exchanged between the alveolus and the blood. And then we're going to talk about internal respiration, where gas is exchanged between the tissues in the blood. So let's see what we got going on here. Some other laws that we have to talk about. First law is Dalton's law. Dalton's law of partial pressures. So what Dalton's law says is that, uh, like we've been saying, the air, the atmospheric air, has a pressure of 760 millimeters of mercury. And this air is, the pressure in this air is made up from different uh, types of gases. There's nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and water vapors in the air. Okay? And so of that 760 millimeters of mercury, 78.6% of it is nitrogen. About 21% of it is oxygen. 0.04% is carbon dioxide and 0.5% is water. So the air, we don't have a lot of carbon dioxide um, in the air. And if we wanted to look at each individual gas, then we would be talking about the pressure of that individual gas which we say is the partial pressure of that gas, right? So um, nitrogen, for example, the partial pressure of nitrogen would be 78.6% um, of 760 millimeters of mercury. Now, we don't talk a lot about nitrogen because our body doesn't, um, is not using it, uh, unless you're talking about decompression syndrome where it gets trapped in your joints and then it causes a lot of pain. Um, but we do, we are going to talk about the partial pressure of oxygen. So the partial pressure of oxygen is 20.9% or 21% of 760. So to figure that out, the partial pressure of oxygen is 760 times 0 0.209, and that gives us 159 millimeters of mercury. So when you're breathing air in, that oxygen has a partial pressure of 159 millimeters of mercury. That's the pressure of oxygen as it's coming into your alveolus. Carbon dioxide, on the other hand, has a very low partial pressure. So we take 7 point, uh, 760 times 0 0.0004, and that gives us 0.3 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so let's look at the alveolus then, right? So we have 159 millimeters of mercury 
of oxygen. That's the partial pressure of oxygen coming into the alveolus. Now in the alveolus, we still have air remaining in there. So there's a lot of carbon dioxide in there that's just still remaining. It hasn't all been pushed out of the alveolus. So the oxygen has to mix with all those carbon dioxide molecules. So when it mixes with the other gases, when the other carbon dioxide, the partial pressure is going to drop. So the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolus is going to drop to 100 millimeters of mercury, okay? just because it's mixing with all those other carbon dioxide molecules. On the other hand, you're breathing in carbon dioxide, and the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is 0.3 millimeters of mercury. So you're, you're, um, when you're breathing that in, carbon dioxide comes in, and it mixes with all this other carbon dioxide that's in the alveolus, so your partial pressure is gonna go up. So the partial pressure of carbon dioxide goes up to 40 millimeters of mercury. So that's what we start with in the alveolus. We start with a partial pressure of oxygen of 100 millimeters of mercury and a partial pressure of carbon dioxide of 40 millimeters of mercury. Now, in external respiration then, the alveolus is going to exchange gases with the um, capillaries, with the alveolar capillaries, right? So when we look at the alveolar capillaries, we have blood coming from the right side of the heart. And that blood is going to be deoxygenated. It's not gonna have a lot of oxygen. That's why it's coming to the lungs, so it can pick up oxygen. So the blood coming to the alveolus is going to have a lower PO2. It's deoxygenated, so it has a PO2 of 40. The carbon dioxide will have a PCO2 a little bit higher, it'll be 45. And why is that? Because it's coming from the tissues. The tissues have just used up the oxygen and produced carbon dioxide as a waste product. So the blood is bringing carbon dioxide to the lung and it's going to want to um, absorb oxygen, right? So another law that we have is called Henry's Law. Basically, what Henry's law is saying is that those gases are going to be squeezed out of one solution and into another. The gases are going to move from a high partial pressure to a low partial pressure, right? So as the oxygen is coming up to the alveolus and the PO2 is 40 millimeters of mercury, and in the alveolus, we have a PO2 of 100 millimeters of mercury. Gas then, based on Henry's law, is going to, which way is oxygen going to want to diffuse? Into the blood, right? So that's important. We need to understand which direction these gases are moving. And you have to memorize the pressures. So oxygen is moving into the blood, right? And then the PO2 can become as high as what the PO2 is in the alveolus. It can kind of reach equilibrium. So the partial pressure starts out at 40 in the blood coming up to the alveolus, and then it leaves the alveolus with a partial pressure of 100. Right? Now it's going to head back through those pulmonary veins to the left side of your heart. So it's going to go back to your left atrium. Now, as it is leaving the lungs, the capillaries surrounding the alveolus are merging together with capillaries that are just supplying the lung tissue. And so oxygen's going to, a little bit of oxygen is going to leave the capillary. So by the time it, it um, leaves the lungs, the PO2 will drop just a little bit to 95. So that's the number that we have going back to the, the heart. And that's the number, that's the PO2 that will be um, distributed to the rest of the body. 
So we just have a little bit of dropping just because those capillaries merge together in the lung. All right. If we look at carbon dioxide then, the carbon dioxide levels are really, uh, they're higher in the pulmonary artery. They're coming from the tissues where tissues just uh, created a bunch of um, CO2 and then dumped it into the blood. So now the CO2 is coming back to the alveolus. You have a PCO2 of 45. And we said that in the, in the alveolus, we had a, a PCO2 of 40. So now carbon dioxide molecules want to move which direction? They want to move from high to low pressure. They're going to move into the alveolus. Okay, the carbon dioxide molecules move into the alveolus. So now in the, um, in the blood, in that capillary, the CO2 levels are going to drop because it's leaving, and the pulmonary veins then have a partial pressure of carbon dioxide of 40 because they will reach equilibrium with the alveolus. Right. So now headed back to the heart, we have a partial pressure of oxygen of 95 and a partial pressure of carbon dioxide of 40. So it's just important. One of the easier things is you have to know which direction the gases move. So at the alveolus, oxygen enters the blood, carbon dioxide leaves the blood. Right. And then you have to know the numbers. The PO2 in the alveolus, the CO2 in the alveolus, and the PO2 and the PCO2 in the blood on either side, coming up to the alveolus and then leaving the alveolus. Because you have to be able to explain it, right? So you have to know those numbers. Now that blood heads to the left side of the heart. So it's going to the left atrium, then into the left ventricle, and then it's going to get pumped out through that aorta. And that blood is going to head to the tissues. Along the way, nothing happens. Because again, no, there's no exchange anywhere except in capillaries, right? So in the arteries, in the arterioles, there's no exchange. And then finally we get down to the capillaries by the tissues. And we're going to have an exchange there. Now this, this is internal respiration because we're at the tissues. Internal respiration. So the oxygen, you know, the, the, the cell, first of all, the cell is busy. And it is using oxygen. So it's going to have low oxygen and it's creating carbon dioxide. That's what cells do. They use the oxygen to make ATP and then they create carbon dioxide in the process. That's the waste product. Okay. So we have a lower um, oxygen level because they've been using oxygen and we have a higher carbon dioxide level because they're making carbon dioxide. So now we see the exchange that happens here. With oxygen, we have a PO2 of 95 in the blood and a PO2 of 40 in the capillaries. So which direction does oxygen move? Yeah, it's going to move into the tissue so the tissue can resupply its oxygen levels. Right? Carbon dioxide is higher in the tissues than it is in the arterial blood. So carbon dioxide will move from the tissues into the capillaries. And they reach equilibrium. So now the blood leaving the tissues will have a PO2 of 40, just like what was in the tissues. And the carbon dioxide will have a PCO2 of 45, just like what was in the tissues. And now they're going to head back to the heart. They head back to the right side of the heart through the vena cava. And we start all over again. Nothing happens to the PO2 and the PCO2 as it goes through the heart and then into those pulmonary arteries. So it's going from systemic veins into the heart and then into the pulmonary arteries and nothing happens to it, right? It's just being transported. And then we go around and around again. And we keep going around and around, picking up oxygen, at the lungs, 
dropping off oxygen at the tissues. Picking up carbon dioxide at the tissues, dropping carbon dioxide off at the lungs. And it just keeps going round and round like that. Okay. Um, all right, one more thing I want to discuss here. I'm going to put these over on the side. Um, we want to talk briefly about the efficiency of diffusion. See in your notes, that's wrong. It says of the blood-brain barrier. No, it's of the blood-oxygen barrier. So it's not the blood-brain barrier. Okay, so let's talk about how efficient is it? What causes that um, gas to be so efficient to be able to cross that respiratory membrane? So it's efficiency of diffusion against, uh, across the um, respiratory membrane, basically, um, and then at the tissues across that um, barrier there. So the first thing is we know that with diffusion, um, the greater the differences between the partial pressures, the greater the differences in any type of diffusion, the faster the diffusion is going to be. And the, um, conversely, um, the, the less of a, you know, the less uh, lower difference that you have or decreased di uh, difference that you have, the slower it's going to be. So, um, for example, a person that's in high altitudes, the PO2 um, is going to be the partial pressure of oxygen in the environment is going to be a lot lower. So that means the partial pressure inside the alveolus is going to be a lot lower. So that means the difference between the alveolus and the blood is going to be less, right? So oxygen's not going to diffuse as fast into the blood. So they get lightheaded. They're not getting enough oxygen. They don't have that concentration, that steep concentration um, difference from 100 millimeters of mercury down to 40 millimeters of mercury. It's going to be less than that because they don't have as much oxygen. So that first thing is the difference in partial pressure. The greater the difference, the faster the diffusion. The second thing is the distance across that respiratory membrane and across the membrane at the tissues. Okay, the distance across the membrane. I'd said before at the alveolus, you had the simple squamous of the alveolus then you had the basement membrane, then you had the simple squamous of the blood vessel. That's your respiratory membrane. Uh, and then you have also surfactant on the inside. So you have all those things that gas has to cross in order to get into the alveolus or in order to get out of the alveolus. Uh, when you have things like pneumonia, where now you have fluid sitting inside that alveolus, that increases that distance. Now that gas has to get through the fluid, then through the respiratory membrane um, to get into the blood. So um, there are things that can increase the distance that will make it more difficult to diffuse oxygen into the blood. Things like um, inflammation of, or fluid in the alveolus. The third thing is that um, the efficiency of diffusion is, um, it, it's efficient because oxygen and carbon dioxide are lipid soluble. They're lipid soluble. So that means they can cross the membrane of that simple squamous cell, of the alveolus, and of the, um, the capillary, and they can move across easily. They don't have to go through channels. They can just cross through the phospholipid bilayer of those cells and move into the blood. The fourth thing that makes this um, very diffusion very efficient is the total surface area of the lung. The, with all of those alveoli 
Um, and you, if you take the surface area of all those alveoli and you add those all up, the total surface area of the lungs is 35 times the surface of your entire body. So there's a lot of surface area. That means that oxygen and carbon dioxide can cross anywhere that um, those alveoli come in contact with those capillaries. There's lots of places for that, that, um, those gases to diffuse, right? You can damage the surface area with disorders like emphysema that actually um, uh, damages the respiratory membrane. And then the last thing, number five, is th it's efficient because the blood flow and the air flow are coordinated. And we've talked about this in this past unit, we said that um, if the alveolus has a lot of oxygen, then the blood vessel will dilate so that oxygen can readily diffuse into that capillary. And we said conversely, if oxygen in that alveolus is decreased, then those uh, blood vessels uh, the precapillary sphincters will constrict, the capillaries will constrict, and then you won't have, I mean, why send the blood to an alveolus that doesn't have a lot of oxygen? So blood will be directed or shunted towards the alveoli that have more oxygen in them. Okay. Um, this could be compromised in the case of if you had a pulmonary embolism where you actually have a, a, a clot obstructing that capillary. Now you've kind of um, taken away that whole system uh, of efficiency. You're not going to be able to get blood going to that alveolus even if it has a lot of oxygen in it. And that would occur with a pulmonary embolism. Okay. All right, so that's it for today.